Rockstead, Twin Cobra, Zero Wing, Botsagun. Any fan of shooting games knows Toaplan, one of the most important STG developers in history. Famous developers like Rising and Cave wouldn't have existed without them. Their earliest games helped define what a vertical shooter would be, while the later games ushered in a new era of bullet hell. Uncompromising and brutal, yet thoughtful in their execution, they kept us coming back again and again to overcome the challenge. Maybe it was the exceptional music, or maybe it was the style. If you were playing a Toa Plan shooter, you knew it. Each game had the soul of the developer behind it, uncompromising in their vision and unwilling to change for broader appeal. It was their way or the highway. And looking back, it was part of what made Toa Plan irreplaceable. This video will showcase every one of their shooting games, from Tiger Heli to Batsagun, using real arcade hardware and PCBs. And while I do own some of them, I don't own all. But my friend Joseph from Nagano, Japan does. And I've got some super exciting news to report. As of this video, right now, our Toa Plan documentary has reached its first goal on Kickstarter. No way! A professional documentary that we just announced weeks ago with actual ex Toa Plan staff. Live interviews with legends like Tatsuya Uemura and Masahiro Yuge, along with other industry legends like Manabu Namiki, Yuichi Tayama, Go Sato, CEO of M2, Ori Naoki. We have famous game and manga artist Joker June of Toaplan and Cave to do the artwork for the Blu-ray set. Heck, we even have Mark Bussler from Classic Game Room, the OG Truxton fanatic, on board as the narrator. Truxton, Truxton, we want Truxton. And it's going to be freaking epic. It's not too late to get in on the exclusives if you're just finding out about this, but it will be soon. So if you don't know about this amazing project, check it out after this video via a link in my description. Because of this special project, you're in for a real treat, as we were able to get Tatsuya Uemura, legendary programmer and composer for many of Toa Plan's classics, to come on camera and give us his personal top five Toa Plan games and you may be very surprised by some of his choices. So without further ado, all 16 games ranked and reviewed, plus Tatsuya Uemura's top five picks. It's time to rock the shooting. As Toa Plan's first game back in 1985, Tiger Heli catches a bit of slack. And sure, it's short at only four stages before looping, along with graphics that are pretty pedestrian given the very limited hardware. But what many don't realize is how evolutionary every mechanic in the game was purposefully designed to be. The screen clearing bomb was the first ever used in a shooting game, becoming a staple of the genre going forward. Programmer Masahiro Yuge explained that the purpose of the bomb was to make the game more fun by providing an aggressive, thrilling weapon that you could use to turn the tables on the enemies with a single shot. The very slow ship speed, another common knock against the game, was also very intentional, as the team wanted beginners to see the bullets more clearly. Making the ship faster means making the bullets faster, while also allowing for more haphazard play to avoid them. Designer yuge -san's goal was to force strategic gameplay, rewarding careful routing and punishing sloppy movement. So while not as exhilarating as a fast-moving ship and equally fast bullets, Tiger Heli helped pioneer methodical, strategic routing in vertical shooting games. And according to yuge -san, the replay rate on the cabinet was very high, so they felt that they succeeded in their goal. Although I have to say, Tiger Heli is absolutely not beginner-friendly, but brutal and unforgiving.
It also had an NES port that isn't nearly as bad as many claim it to be. While it's downgraded in graphics as expected, the music transitioned well and the difficulty curve was adjusted well for home console versus the brutal arcade. Selling over a million copies, it clearly struck a chord. There was also a later PS1 port as part of the Toloplan shooting battle, and the very recent M2 release on Switch and PS4, featuring arcade-perfect ports of both this game and Kyukyoku Tiger in all their glory, along with the shot triggers treatment and gadgets that you've come to expect. Every story has a beginning, and for Toloplan, that's Tiger Heli, a foundation to build upon learn lessons, and make improvements with each successive step. So while not a top-tier shooter by today's standards, Tiger Heli's importance can't be denied. And for all it could have done better, it also showed a very thoughtful design, with every segment, enemy wave, and checkpoint purposeful and deliberate, an approach to game design that would become a staple of Toaplan shooters going forward. If you want to learn more on its history, including its roots as an older game called Gyrodyne developed by Crux, I did a really good in-depth historical on the Tiger series a while back, which you can always check out later. While Tiger Heli won't keep most modern gamers' attention for long, seeming like a flawed game, it was one of the better and more popular shooters to arrive in 85. In fact, according to the wiki, it was listed as the most popular Japan table arcade game in October of that year, besting titles like Gradius and Ghosts and Goblins. And while Tiger Heli is no Gradius, it's a thoughtfully designed, seminal shooter that influenced the genre and kept many coming back over and over to play during its arcade run, earning it a solid B in my book and much more so in terms of its historical importance to the genre. It may seem average and primitive today, but it was anything but in 1985. Released one year later in 1986, Slap Fight was a huge step forward from Tiger Heli in almost every respect, despite still being on older, limited hardware, including a very limited PSG sound chip. The graphics were much improved and the gameplay depth was on a completely different level. Far more interesting and detailed backdrops, and actual mid-stage bosses before progressing to the next section. But that's not the main reason it's still beloved by so many Toaplan fans today. No, not that reason. It's the unique combination of gameplay mechanics that few games have managed to copy or improve upon since. The power-up system is based on Gradius, a game Masahiro Yuge was a fan of, where you pick up stars and select your loadout dynamically as you play. However, unlike Gradius, where you can power up and just keep your favorite loadout until the end, Slap Fight provides more choices and makes swapping between them integral to completing the game. Yuge-san loved games with lots of hidden secrets to discover, and Slap Fight is packed with them. Very unique for a shooter of any generation, he noted that for each segment of the game, they can considered which weapon would be best, then made sure there were enough power-ups to switch to it. So once you learn which weapon is best for each area, you can always take advantage. But it goes beyond that. All of the secrets they packed into the game, many of which require a specific weapon to uncover, are also the exact same weapon that's best for that section. It was done on purpose to give the player a hint of which weapon is most effective. So once you figure that out, you'll have the best loadout and the right weapon to uncover most of the secrets. Talk about baking strategy into the gameplay. So if you're playing slap fight haphazardly, you're missing out on most of what makes it such an interesting game. Oh, and there's a twist. As you upgrade and change your loadout, your ship gets bigger. Much bigger. So there's a trade-off between having more powerful weapons and the ability to dodge incoming bullets. Before games like Dragon Spirit and others followed, Slap Fight pioneered an increasing ship size to offset improved firepower. Only in this case, it's not simply there to hinder you and make it harder, but also force you to find the right loadout and use it to your advantage. It's a brilliant combination of gameplay elements that, as I said before, hasn't really been done quite like it since.
the music by Masahiro Yuge is catchy and perfect for the addictive nature of the game. In fact, despite the limited sound chip, I absolutely love the way Slap Fight sounds. <laughs> bringing me back to those 8-bit days and that Master System sound. Slap Fight also has a heck of a history on the Mega Drive, handed off to Makito Ichikawa of m and Software for the port, concurrently working on four projects simultaneously, including Streets of Rage 2. He practically worked himself to death, making it everything he wanted it to be, slowly getting sicker in the process, eventually having to work from home and not able to leave his bed yet continuing to work and ending up in the hospital. So he constantly included version information as he progressed, not knowing which one would make it to market. Crazy! Well, I'm happy to report that he survived the ordeal and is still working in the industry. And due to his hard work and dedication, the Mega Drive port is one of the coolest ways to play the game. With a special mode that included updated graphics, new levels and bosses, and even more added depth and strategy. But that's not all. This special mode's music was done by famous composer Yuzo Koshiro, and Slap Fight slaps when it comes to those chip tunes. never played or heard the great music in this mode, run, don't walk, and find a way to try it out. You won't regret it. Now it's still a pretty short game where a single loop can be completed in 15 minutes, then continuing into successively harder loops. And it lacks the graphical and oral pizzazz of the games that followed, but it's considered a classic by those who've uncovered its secrets. And I definitely agree. It's incredibly replayable, and the Mega Drive port is an instance where you can even enjoy it improved with the home version. Slap Fight was only Toaplan's second game, but in an absolute winner and an easy A ranking, still one of the most unique shooting games around. To say that Hishizami, aka Flying Shark, was a seminal game that influenced nearly all vertical shooters going forward wouldn't be an understatement. But don't just take my word for it. Here's famous composer Manabu Namiki in a recent interview saying just that. Simply looking at the gameplay, you can see the DNA for future hits like Raiden, with its ground-based sniper tanks and methodical, routing-based tactics. Contrary to its appearance, Hishizami was designed as a game that didn't require extraordinary reflex or hand-eye coordination to clear, but by using tricks and memorizing enemy patterns. Uemura-san noted in an interview that though the term memorizer wasn't used in those days, that's the style of game they were aiming to create. Much like Raiden that followed, the speed of some sniper bullets are so fast that killing those enemies quickly as they appear before they can fire is a key strategy for survival. So while it seems that clearing the game would be based on natural skill and reaction, the opposite is true. It's this formula of tricky enemy placement, treacherous ground forces that snipe you with fast, aimed bullets, and a slower ship that forces you to learn the game, finally put together in a complete package with updated graphics and great tunes that made it a hit in arcades. 
literally Toa Plan's biggest arcade hit, the second highest grossing table arcade in 1987 Japan. Unlike their first game, Tiger Heli, Flying Shark is supremely playable and just damn fun. Toa Plan's early formula perfected, causing other developers to take notice and produce similar games of their own. So while Flying Shark may look familiar, it's for good reason. It's the first prototypical vertical scrolling shooter that games going forward attempted to duplicate. The setting isn't creative. A typical war theme with jungles, oceans, and deserts. Heavily influenced by Apocalypse Now. A mountain of ports and conversions followed for nearly every home computer system, along with an NES port retitled Sky Shark in the US. Some even had cool audio remixes like the FM Towns and Shark Ports. By today's standards, Flying Shark looks typical, and that's because in 1987, it was prototypical, less brutal than its predecessors, fun and replayable. It found the sweet spot and became an arcade hit, a perfect example of excellent early game design that transcends its limits and remains as replayable as ever. No bosses, no weapon changes, mundane backgrounds. None of it stops Flying Shark from being fun and a pure shooting experience with great music to back it up. While Toa Plan refined and improved the formula further, Hishizami is definitely an A-tier game in my book. Later the same year, with the success of Hishizami being realized, Toa Plan already released the sequel to Tiger Heli, the infamous Kyoku Tiger. But unlike the former, Q Tiger made no bones about its true purpose, the thrill of blowing shit up. Masahiro Yuge stated that the goal was to make a game that was fun to play, even if you're drunk. A game that people would get passionate about. The explosions were bigger, the bass and sound effects beefier, the bombs larger and more destructive than any of the previous games. And the music, oh man the music, is some of the best Toa Plan ever produced. They really tried to make it appeal to anyone passing by the cabinet, calling them in to throw in a credit and give it a go. Cute Tiger had attitude and style, and it was also as brutal as it was cool. And one thing that I've learned over the years is that no matter how good you are or aren't at this game, it'll always kick your ass in a hurry and without notice. It gives you the tools. Now four different power-ups to choose from and far more effective than any game before. The bombs now provide a good bit of invincibility and damage. In fact, Q Tiger was again a shooting game first, introducing the idea of cycling power-ups that allow you to choose your weapon as they float around the screen. But it's all offset by a brutal enemy AI that's so menacing it'll make Raiden blush. And in fact, there's no other game that Raiden borrowed from more heavily than Q Tiger. From the heavy, satisfying explosions, to the killer music style, but especially the bullets that not only aim, but lead you. Almost knowing where you'll be before you get there. Ground targets will snipe you from any angle while enemy choppers swoop in from the sides and behind. All while larger ships spray the screen with fixed patterns. You'll be praying for the simpler, more predictable patterns of Flying Shark, once this tiger gets its claws into you. Q Tiger also upped its game in terms of variety, suddenly offering 10 long stages to complete, each with its own boss or bosses that become terrifyingly dangerous. Multiple tanks will spray the screen with ultra-fast bullets that only strict pattern memorization and timely use of bombs will overcome. One screw up and bam, back to a checkpoint you go. Q Tiger is riding three years before there was riding, which took this formula and amped it up with improved hardware and graphics. Again, a big seller for Toa Plan. It was popular enough to release internationally as Twin Cobra, with changes like a two-player mode, slightly faster red chopper, and respawns instead of checkpoints. It had multiple ports, including the Mega Drive and PC Engine, along with the FM Towns and Sharp 68000 computers. And of course, the recent M2 Ultimate Tiger 
Tiger Shot Traders collection, of which I go much more in depth in a recent video. But I've said it before and I'll say it again. Q Tiger is brutal. Q Tiger is badass. It may not be everyone's cup of tea, but it is one of the best classic vertical shooters to come out of the 80s. It exudes Toa Plan style and has the same intricate strategic gameplay of its predecessors. The difficulty is no joke, but it's also great! And a second eight tier game in the same year by Toa Plan. Tatsujin is a game that stood the test of time. While the previous four games are well remembered and loved by many, none of them bring out the passion of fans like the mere mention of Truxton. Truxton, Truxton, we want Truxton. Truxton, or Tatsujin, is special. Special enough to be my most played game of the Toa Plan library. But it wasn't the most popular upon release. Sure, it sold well in Japan, the top table arcade game in November of 88, but it never reached the heights of Flying Shark or Kyukyoku Tiger, nor did it do well internationally, despite two good ports on the Mega Drive and PC Engine. Because Tatsujin didn't care what you want. From the moment you left the dock, it smacked you down with great vengeance and furious anger. Less than a minute in, and the very first pair of mini bosses put most players to bed. Because Tatsujin means master, and Tatsujin takes no prisoners. But simply a hard game does not a masterpiece make. And what makes Tatsujin a masterpiece is that despite its brutality, you just can't stay away. Uncompromising and difficult, yes, but also magic. There's no one aspect that makes Tatsujin what it is, but every element coming together to create a zen-like experience that's rarely been equaled since. Dropping the war motif in favor of sci-fi, artist Naoki Ogiwara created what would become known as the Toa Plan look. Large, sharp, beefy ships, and an otherworldly, insect-like vibe that was a style all its own. That skull bomb that became the face of Toa Plan, symbolizing their violent and rebellious nature. And the Thunder Laser, one of the most badass weapons to ever cross a shoot 'em up. Artist Ogiwara-san would move on to other games before co-founding Cave after Toa Plan's bankruptcy. It was the only portion of the game assisted by another, with every other aspect crafted to Masahiro Yuge's vision. The design, programming, and even the music was all done by Yuge-san. And the soundtrack wasn't just good, it was mesmerizing. <laughs> Every one of the five stages is fantastic, with entrancing beats and melodies that pull you into the game and bring you into a zone. The stages flow from one into another with no stop or break, one continuous game until you reach the end, only to continue again into a second, more difficult loop. The various mid-stage bosses move and spit bullets at lightning speed and with a carefree grace, dancing around the screen as if performing a ballet to the entrancing music. The slow ship speed is gone, replaced with plenty of speed-ups until you're zipping around the screen like a hummingbird, and the bullet AI is refined, mean as ever, with both aimed and set patterns, but without the frustrating snipers of Q Tiger. Everything in Tatsujin can be predicted. Everything can be mastered. But it takes a master to best Tatsujin. But master or not, Tatsujin can be enjoyed by all if they give it a chance. Don't play by reflex, but by memory and intuition. Don't dodge lightning fast bullets. That's impossible. Know where they'll be, and then be somewhere else. Just like the Matrix, the way to master Tatsuja isn't to dodge bullets, but to not have to. As there is no spoon, Yuge-san designed it that way. Placing yourself in the right position to the enemy will ensure your safety. 
And it's this dance between you and the enemy. Them running their pattern and you running yours. Like a dance with the devil until one of you dies. That creates the magic. To finally know Tatsujin is to get a glimpse of the inner workings of Yuge-san's mind and to see the brilliance in his design. So yes, Tatsujin is special. It's Yuge-san's realization of what he wanted to be the perfect shooting experience for experts. And while not everyone will reach the end, even short moments of that zen-like experience, those precious seconds where memory and intuition take over and you're finally playing in rhythm with the game that provide that glimpse into what truly mastering Tatsujin can be like. It's like becoming one with the Matrix. And it's brilliant. Tatsujin is Toa Plan's first S-tier game and one of the greatest shooting experiences ever crafted. Spaceships of red, blue, and green. You can hear that alien lady scream. Truxton, Truxton, we want Truxton. Hellfire was Toa Plan's first experiment in making a horizontal shooter, a project that turned out to be far more challenging than they could have expected. Despite being the same genre, the two formats couldn't be more different, and Toa Plan was starting from scratch. The development suffered one hardship after another, running into technical problems and struggling to make it as interesting or exhilarating as their previous games. Though Hellfire was well received by most reviewers, it was poorly received by the harshest critic of all, Toa Plan themselves. But despite their own taste for the game they created, the fan base found a lot more to enjoy. In fact, the Toa Plan DNA is alive and well here, building strategy right into the weapon system, where constantly cycling through four different shot types is necessary for survival. Enemy waves and obstacles are specifically designed to attack you from various angles, requiring memorization of which shot works best for each area. As expected, Hellfire is no cakewalk and a tough game, but while recovery from certain checkpoints is difficult, it's always possible. It was the international release that broke this careful balance by removing checkpoints and replacing them with respawns. And while that sounds like it would make the game easier, it simply forces you into impossible scenarios. Dying in a difficult section and respawning with a pea shooter is impossible, causing you to chain death and credit feed to survive. Hellfire is a case where the international version, despite a cool two-player option, feels broken and inferior to the original, as it removes the strategy of recovery and simply forces you to survive in impossible situations after making a mistake. The game simply wasn't designed for it. Hellfire was ported to the Mega Drive by Toa Plan themselves with excellent results, including some enhancements like your ship changing color depending on your weapon. And while the other PC Engine ports stuck to the two-player version along with respawns, the difficulty was lowered considerably, making it far more playable than its arcade counterpart. It also had a rock and remixed soundtrack by T's Music. I actually did a head-to-head -head comparison of these two ports in a separate video. Hellfire is actually a well-remembered, reviewed, and regarded port, with many still having a nostalgia for it, especially the console variants. It was Toa Plan themselves that didn't feel it lived up to their standards. The graphics weren't anything to rave about, and the stage designs didn't have much continuity, feeling like various concepts slapped together. But it excelled in what Toa Plan did well, strategic, thoughtful level design and gameplay that provided a challenge for shooting fans, along with the really good soundtrack that's still remembered today. It simply failed to live up to the lofty expectations set by the previous games. Despite this, I personally feel it's a very solid first effort in horizontal shooters and consider it a B-grade game, certainly above average and worthy of playing. It just doesn't measure up to other horizontal shooting greats of the time.
Dyson Poo, or Twin Hawk internationally is probably the least known game in Toloplan's library. Even Twin Hawk was only released in Europe, never making it to the US or most other countries. Its lack of popularity wasn't due to poor quality, but its inability to capture most players' imagination like previous games did. After the bombastic Kyukyoku Tiger that smashed arcades, Dyson Poo felt quaint and like a step backward, revisiting the World War theme yet again. Its gameplay is some of the slowest and measured of the catalog. It almost has a chill, sleepy pace to the game, versus the exhilaration many look for in a shooter. That's not to say it isn't well made, nor devoid of innovation. Its primary mechanic is your squadron of planes that you call up using the bomb button to increase your firepower and provide some protection. But these aren't temporary and stay with you for as long as they survive. As they take hits, they'll kamikaze at death into the nearest enemy. It's this mechanic and the very slow, deliberate pace that defines Dyson Poo. Like Tiger Heli, there's only ground enemies, and pretty spongy at that, taking a lot of hits. So an important part of the gameplay is knowing when the tankier enemies are coming, and being ready to speed kill them as quickly as possible. Some players love the slower strategic gameplay that's less demanding on the reflexes, but for many, it just didn't call to them in the same way, resulting in less exposure and popularity. The game was solid, garnering decent reviews and getting both Mega Drive and PC Engine ports, both of which were well done and quite playable prior to their more thrilling games, it may have been better received. But after the 10 long stages and bosses of Q-Tiger, or the high-speed, glorious gameplay of Tatsujin, Dyson Poo felt like a game that should have released a couple years prior, with its four stages and simpler gameplay that was already improved upon by Toaplan themselves. Along with the pedestrian presentation, it's no surprise it didn't get as much attention. Nevertheless, Dyson Poo remains a solid game if you're looking for the oldest of old-school vertical shooting with a kamikaze twist. Dyson Poo still delivers in terms of thoughtful strategic gameplay, coupled with its slower pace. It's good for a relaxing evening along with a drink to wind down. Myself being a fan of faster paced games, it's not quite my cup of tea, despite being able to appreciate what it is. So my personal ranking of Dyson Poo is a B-. It just doesn't call to me like their other games, though your mileage may vary, as it still has many fans out there as well. All your base are belong to Toa Plan, except Toa Plan actually had nothing to do with that phrase. It coming from a terrible translation of its European Mega Drive port. It wasn't even a meme back then, not until the internet. But when you hit gold and go viral, you don't ask why, you just roll with it. But aside from the meme that made history, zeroing is unique for something else. Sure, it was Toa Plan's second and final horizontal shooter, but it was also an experiment, a collaboration and contest across all of Toa Plan that never happened again. In fact, it wasn't originally even meant to be a commercial release at all, but as a training project for recruits and staff. Literally everyone at the company was unleashed to work on parts of the game, even ending up with three different composers for the music. Only afterward, it was decided to make it a commercial release, as an even more practical way of training, with now the main programmers and composers suddenly becoming involved. And if you know anything about Toa Plan, and the wild, hot-headed nature of that old guard, then you'll know it turned into a heated battle within the company, with both pride and bragging rights on the line. So it's no surprise by Tatsuya Uemura's own admission that much of the game seems cobbled together with varying art styles, stage designs, and music that seem to all have been combined from various different games. And yet, Zeroing turned out to be game far better than it ever should have. Maybe it was the competitive spirit that brought out the best in everyone involved. Whatever the case, Zeroing is undoubtedly a step up from Hellfire in some ways. The stage designs and enemies are always created, mixing gory and organic creatures with otherworldly backdrops. The music is off the charts, collectively some of the best work Toa Plan ever produced. And 
the game had some unique mechanics to set it apart from the rest. In addition to options that flank your ship and are used to block bullets, you also get a tractor beam that can suck in most enemies to use them as a shield, or fire them back out, along with bombs that can be picked up in the same way. Overall, it's still fairly a standard shooter in terms of mechanics. The game is long with 8 stages and provides plenty of challenge, while the variety keeps it from getting dull. Zero Wing also found lots of success with its home ports, especially on the Mega Drive. Hilarious intro notwithstanding, it sported upgraded sound design making the already legendary soundtrack even better. And although it couldn't measure up to the arcade in terms of graphics, it found a nice balance between challenging gameplay and accessibility for the console market. It even added a ton of special endings depending on how many times you can finish it. It also saw a decent, though less successful port to the PC Engine. Again, I did a detailed head-to-head -head comparison of these two ports, but suffice to say, the Mega Drive port rules supreme in my eyes. But Toa Plan, man they're a tough crowd. Despite being well reviewed and praised, they still felt it wasn't up to par with the brilliance of their vertical classics. And to be fair, they're not wrong at least in terms of gameplay. Due to them not feeling like they could make a horizontal shooter that lives up to their name, it was the last they ever produced. Which is a shame, as history has shown a nostalgia and following for both games, but especially Zero Wing, for its artwork, for its music, and for its solid, if not inspiring gameplay. And yes, for the accidental and infamous translation, at least the Mega Drive port. It all comes together into a package that for many is more than the sum of its parts. And while not a perfect game by any means, Zero Wing does enough to be a B-tier game in my mind overall. A B-plus, actually. What can I say? I'm a sucker for dishing out great justice to an amazing soundtrack. Big flying shark, but felt it was a bit old school. Great gameplay and tunes, but you wanted more content and flash. Well, look no further than the sequel, Fire Shark, or its original name, Same Same Same. Same game with three times the awesome. Fire Shark got the tiger treatment. Graphics are much improved with more detailed and diverse environments. Now, across 10 long stages, the weapons are ultra powerful with an original spread shot that blankets the screen at full power, while the flamethrower steals the show visually, flowing across the screen in waves and even protecting your rear. And you now collect speed ups, so a slow plane is merely punishment for death. And that's a good thing, because even with your upgraded arsenal, the original Japanese arcade cabinet will hand you your ass. Due to what Masahiro Yuge claimed was constant pressure by arcade operators and against their better judgment, he regrets not being able to balance the difficulty in a way that would satisfy the operators and the players. If you thought Kyukyoku Tiger was hard or unfair, this is a game that makes all others blush with its bullet speed and sniper tanks. Just like Raiden that followed, the screen also scrolls horizontally. You'll get absolutely brutalized by hidden enemies until you memorize every tricky part of the game. And once you do get good and reach full power on weapons, you'll be amazed at how fast the bullets become due to rank and as the game progresses. Routing is essential and playing by reflex nearly impossible. But Same 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 is a great game. And like all great games, they keep you coming back no matter how far you get or how much you suck. It's cool to the bone and thrilling like few others. Partly due to another great soundtrack composed by Yugi-san. It's 
Hisha Zami on steroids. And while not nearly as accessible, it's a hell of a good time until you inevitably crash and burn. A two-player version was later released, making the game easier, along with the International Fire Shark, which also became slightly more forgiving by lowering the enemy count, slowing down the bullets, and making the bosses just a bit more reasonable. But I'll emphasize slightly, as neither version is a joke and will eat you alive. It's the two-player version you want, unless you're a masochist or a super player. For how cool Fire Shark was, it only saw one port, though a solid one on the Mega Drive. And while it's not nearly as insane or thrilling like the arcade, it's also the one version most can play and actually enjoy for more than a few stages. Fire Shark isn't as mesmerizing to play as Tatsujin. It's way too nerve-wracking. It's simply hardcore in its execution and keeps you coming back for its coolness. But very few get to enjoy it deep into the game. Of all the Toa Plan games, it reminds me of Raiden more than any other, for better and for worse. It's flashy flamethrower, the crazy fast bullets and snipers, and a difficulty that requires near flawless routing at the halfway point and beyond. But it's otherwise a fantastic game and reason I'm excited for the upcoming M2 collection later this year, as the ability to customize the difficulty and play the arcade original on easier modes will open up a whole new audience to this killer game, making it an S-tier experience. But as it stands, Same 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 is an A-tier game that's hard to enjoy very long for most players, making it an A- minus for me, but it's just a handful of balance tweaks away from being an S, because it's one of the baddest shooters in the library. Zone isn't technically a shooter, it's a vertical run and gun, but damn if it isn't amazing, easily in my Toa Plan Top 5. It's got the same DNA of their best shooters, and is in my opinion, one of their very best games. Tatsuya Uemura stated that Outzone was his most difficult project that he ever worked on, being that he couldn't use the same concepts that he would for traditional scrolling shooters. So they implemented more puzzle elements, along with ways to keep the player moving. Despite being able to control the scrolling, the pacing and enemies are relentless, partially due to your ever-draining energy meter. E-pickups are the only way to replenish it, so you best keep moving or death awaits. In terms of hardware, Outzone was a big step up, immediately obvious by the gorgeous graphics, again done by Naoki Ogiwara that worked on Tatsujin. Along with the programming, Uemura-san also composed that excellent soundtrack, another one of his great compositions where nearly every stage is a banger and perfectly complements the style and pace of the game. Unlike many of Toll Plan's other games, where a two-player option was added later as an afterthought for international release, Outzone integrates it masterfully, figuring out the puzzle-like sections with a friend, taking turns laying down cover fire while the other pushes forward, adds a new dimension to the gameplay. There are two base weapons, a powerful directional shot that's tough to control, and a weaker spread that only fires forward, and you'll need both for various areas of the game. There are also some really creative special weapons to find, like the rotating ball of doom that's far more effective than it has any right to be, along with a ton of hidden secrets to uncover, from zero wing ships to fire shark squadrons, to an actual Tatsujin satellite that follows you around and provides extra firepower. Outzone pays plenty of homage and has tons of secrets. And while it may be a run and gun, the relentless pace and aggressive enemies give it an STG flavor. It's a run and gun that feels like a schmuck mixed with strategy, and it's a killer combination. It may have been rough going for the team behind it, but they knocked it out of the park, far as I'm concerned, and created one of their most special games. Outzone was also well received, making multiple top 5 arcade lists, including a decent run internationally, but it deserved 
far more for its quality. It never saw a home port and remained obscure for decades. And I featured it in my best arcade exclusive games video a while back and found a large audience that never heard of it, yet thought it looked amazing from the footage. Which it is. Outzone is in fact amazing. The graphics and art design are gorgeous. The music and sound effects are fantastic. It's got the Toa Planet attitude that you've come to expect from their games. And most importantly, the gameplay is both thrilling and cerebral. Fast paced, yet forcing you to think and figure out the way to best each section. It's hard, but not so insanely hard that some practice can't overcome. And the checkpoints are fair with power-ups aplenty. I was able to keep retrying each checkpoint I died until I figured out the way. Like most Toa Plan games, if you die too soon, it'll set you back an extra checkpoint, not as punishment, but so you can power up even earlier and have a fair shot at making it through. Yet the enemies never stop coming, and the clock never stops ticking. It's got everything I'd ever want in a vertical run and gun, and I can't recommend it more highly. Outzone is one of my favorites, and an S-tier Toa Plan game in the library. love Tatsujin and want to enjoy it more, but the difficulty and bullet speed is just too crazy for you. Well, think of Vimana as your Tatsujin light. True, not as crazy good. Few games are, but it's got upgraded and creative graphics with a similar look, layout, and themes. Some really good music, this time by composer Toshiaki Tomizawa, that worked on Zero Wing and later with Cave on many of their games, and similar gameplay and enemy types, with plenty of mid-stage bosses coming in multiples, only everything is slowed down for a more chill pacing. So it's a shame Vimana didn't get more exposure, as it's a perfect game for those wanting to dip their toe into Toa Plan. The one area Vimana lacks is badass weaponry, with just a single shot type that gets upgraded. Instead, you have a charge shot, which is critical to the gameplay and used far more than most games. A spread that covers the screen. It's extremely useful, and you'll find yourself using it about as often as the standard shot. You also get a bomb stock, which is quite unique, as instead of clearing the screen, a set of orbs circle your ship, and every time you press bomb again, one of them fires out and destroys an enemy until they've all been depleted. Now that's not to say Vimana is easy. No Toll Plan game board of the arcade is. It'll still present a good challenge to everyone but seasoned players as you progress farther. But it's far more fair and predictable without snipers or trick deaths to upend your run. It would have been a great game to port to home consoles and I feel would have found a larger audience to enjoy. A game that would have felt right at home on the Mega Drive. Second special mention goes to the great music, which really sounds like Zero Wings, brother from another mother, and nearly stands toe to toe with that classic. It's really that good without a bad track in the bunch, and if you're a fan of great chiptunes in a shooter, Vimana needs to be on your shortlist. Like Tatsujin and some other Toa Plan games, the stages have continuity and flow into each other, something I always really enjoyed and I wish was done more often. The mana was a flop for Toa Plan in terms of arcade sales. It just didn't strike a chord with many players, possibly for not being hard enough until the second loop for the experts, or flashy and addicting enough for the casual arcade goer. It lacks the attitude of Tatsujin and others, but it's still a really good game. Mana sits in the B plus tier for me and is likely an easy A for anyone looking for an entry level Toa Plan game. If you've not heard of or tried it yet, give it a shot and you may be surprised to enjoy it quite a bit for the mere fact it doesn't eat you for lunch at the start.
Su Jin Ho is absolutely insane. And I mean that in both the very best and also the worst ways. The visuals are freaking amazing, not just for their time, but even by today's standards. It's one of the coolest looking games ever made, with incredible artwork by Toa Plans Tatsujin King of Art Design, Naoki Ogiwara. Masahiro Yuge returns as composer for the sequel, only focusing on the music and no longer involved in the programming or design like the original, and he crafted another masterpiece worthy of the name. It also brings the Toa Plan attitude with meaty sound effects and explosions. The biggest problem with this sequel is that it's equally insane in terms of gameplay and balance. Having the clear distinction of being the hardest game Toa Plan ever made. No, scratch that. One of the hardest games ever made, period. According to the Japanese wiki, it took a month for anyone to clear the first loop, and an entire year for anyone to clear the second. We're talking about the best Japanese super players, likely the world. The first loop of Tatsujino is like the brutal second loop of Image Fight. Yeah, it's that hard. But the problem isn't that it's hard, as plenty of top tier games still are. It's the why that makes it nuts. The original Tatsujin was brutal, but fair. Upon death, you at least had a decent weapon to get back in the game, speed up, and power up. But here, your starting weapon is so weak that recovery is often a matter of both perfection and luck. The power-ups, which normally reset upon death in most games, do not. They just continue in sequence. So whether you'll get the right set of speed and power every time you die is again a toss-up. It doesn't help that the bomb pickups are extremely scarce, so unlike the original where they could be used strategically as a resource, here they need to be hoarded and used very sparingly. Thankfully, the international version Truxton 2 takes it down a notch in terms of enemy aggression and beefs up your weapon. But again, I emphasize slightly, as both versions are the epitome of unforgiving. It only has six stages, but only is a relative term, as each stage is long, several minutes plus, and completing the entire game takes just short of an hour. So not only is Tatsujino insanely hard, but it's nearly an hour of insanely hard. On the plus side, each stage is more like two to three stages, seamlessly transitioning from one background to another, feeling like you've played through 12 or more unique levels by game's end. Of course, not you or I will be seeing the game's end, not even with infinite credits anytime soon, not unless we cheat. With all that out of the way, it's a testament to how absolutely incredible the game is to play that it's still so loved. We may suck at it, like really suck at it, but we try to enjoy as far as we do get for a taste of what it feels like to simply play. The gameplay is thrilling, the music is rocking, the visuals and explosions eye searing. It's everything a great shooter should be, blocked by an impenetrable difficulty. It's amazing that despite all its flaws, it's an incredible game that needs to be experienced. And it's honestly just like Fire Shark, a handful of gameplay tweaks away from being an S-tier game, which is again why the eventual M2 port is so exciting, as with the easy and custom modes now being made available. Many are hoping to find a perfect balance of difficulty to enjoy this killer game. Until then, the arcade original sits in the A-tier for me, and a minus actually, and that's being generous because it's just hard to play without putting a smile on your face, until that smile turns to pain. If it weren't for how amazing the game is otherwise, it'd be in the B tier or below for the inaccessibility and balance issues, much more so than Fire Shark, as that game is simply brutal, but also brilliant. I wouldn't call Tatsujino's gameplay brilliant, I'd call it purposefully masochistic. It's just how good it is, despite all the flaws, that makes its ranking for me. Maybe an S tier game for anyone good enough to actually complete or at least reach the late stages. But impossible for mere mortals. I think I speak for most of us when I say, the M2 port of Tatsujino can't come soon enough.
Fixate is the spiritual successor to one of my favorite Toa Plan games, Outzone. And believe it or not, I never got a chance to play it until reviewing it for this video. Did it live up to the original? First thing I did after playing through it and writing down my notes was to check out how my opinion compared to others online, and I was really surprised to see how divided they were. It ranged from not even close to Outzone to superior in every way. If expecting Outzone Part 2, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. The original team didn't work on Fixate, so it doesn't look, sound, or play much like it at all. The graphics are solid with large sprites, though the color palette is much more pastel. I personally preferred the bolder colors and artistic detail of the original, having that Tatsujin look to the artwork. But Fixate has more stage variety, with ever-changing levels and obstacles, and even some hoverbike stages thrown in just to change it up. It has eight unique characters with different arsenals that change up the gameplay, with some being far more powerful than others. And it does away with the checkpoint system now respawning you at death. Which brings up the other big difference. Fixate is far easier than Outzone and great as an entry-level toe plan game. It's a game you can credit feed if so inclined. More stages, more characters, no checkpoints, solid gameplay. You can see why many feel it superior. But not so fast, my friend. Trouble is, at least for me, it doesn't quite feel like a Toe Plan game. Just a good game. Outzone had a fast, frantic pace and was thrilling to play. It kept a fire lit under your butt with its draining energy meter and constantly respawning enemies. It also had some really fun and brilliant puzzles throughout each stage, which the checkpoint system reinforced. You had to figure out an area to progress and couldn't just die and keep going. But the biggest transgression of all, if you know anything about me, is the music. Fixate just isn't that great compared to the pantheon of legendary Toa Plan titles. Nor are the sound effects all that special. It is well composed, very orchestral with a lot of drum beats, but it just doesn't jive with the gameplay. So at least for me, when you take away the music, my preference for the original artwork and the faster yet more rewarding gameplay, Outzone comes out the winner. So the biggest problem with Fixate is that it lives in Outzone's shadow, despite having a completely different name. As taken on its own, it's still a really good game. It does remove much of the frustration that detractors of Outzone dislike. Much like Vimana, another very good game, it may not live up to its spiritual predecessor, but is still worth playing, especially for its accessibility, making it good for all skill levels. And again, for as many like myself that prefer Outzone, there's a contingent who feel the opposite and would much rather play Fixate. At the end of the day, I don't rank games based on every detail and the sum of their parts, but how big a smile a game puts on my face every time I play. And with Outzone, that smile is big and bold. Fixate doesn't quite do that in the same way, but has lots of other positive aspects to offset it. If the music was amazing, like Vimana, this could be an A-tier game, as it still checks all the boxes with a solid presentation and tons of gameplay variety. But for me, it's a B plus overall. So think of it this way, it's at best an A and at worst a B. It's certainly not average and the character variety is wonderful. That's still pretty dang good and you should play it yourself and decide what it may be for you. already thought Tatsujin O was one of the coolest looking shooters out there, Dogyun will knock your socks off. From a presentation standpoint, it's virtually unequaled in the genre to this day, with some of the most varied, creative, and detailed stages and enemies ever created. The amazing art design was done by virtually unknown Hayashi Miho, who Tatsuya Uemura called one of the two best game artists to work at Toa Plan, along with Tatsujin King Naoki Ogiwara. Hayashi Miho was the mastermind behind the impressive art design, even coming up with the idea to have the stage 2 boss blast a hole out of the ship transitioning between stages, then having it programmed into the game. Dogyun's design needs no further explanation as the visuals speak for themselves. The game is simply breathtaking. According to Tatsuya Uemura, the goal was to create the best graphics they'd ever done, and they certainly succeeded, with detailed animation in the stages and bosses not seen in any of their previous games. So much so that Uemura-san went on to state that actual gameplay was kind of unimaginative. They put all their time into the presentation and felt that they could have balanced both. 
Another area Dagyun shines is in its soundtrack, again composed solely by Tatsuya Uemura. With his trademark sound that gave some of the best Toplan games their soul. Combined with the amazing visuals, Dogyu never runs out of steam through its 10 stages, constantly transitioning from one stage design to another, an enemy variety that never gets repetitive, even though weapons are designed around visual splendor, with each lighting up the screen with their brilliant color. The weapon system is actually unique in that it has no power levels, simply switching between them and always maxed out. This feature, along with a default fast ship, makes checkpoint recovery in Dogyu easier and far less of a gameplay element, as you're always sped up and quickly powered up. Your only other weapon pickups are the satellites, which come in a couple flavors. One gives you hyperspeed by simply holding down the bomb button and is unlimited, and while situational, also extremely useful for certain bosses in the game and a good strategy. The other option is for a single, limited bomb, but ultra powerful that kills most mid-bosses instantly. Finally, there's a third mechanic that lets you pick up small enemies and items with the rear of your ship, as it seems very situational and risky, not something worth using often just to protect your ass. But I later learned it has more function to uncover various secrets within the game by picking up certain items, which I won't spoil here. But it also has a really cool secondary function of allowing you to pick up player 2 and combining it with your ship to form a larger, more powerful version. So when playing with a friend, you just pick them up for moments to create a super ship then let them go afterward. Or you can even start a two-player game, pick up the second ship, and just play as a super ship the entire game. But basically a mechanic that can be ignored completely, and the game played without it unless you're playing with a friend, or pulling off tricky mechanics for score. Oh, and of honorable mention is that originally, some wanted Dogyun to be a giant mech fighting game, and while that didn't quite pan out, a nice easter egg is thrown in at the end for those that are in the know. Dogyun is also no joke in terms of difficulty, being properly Toa Plan hard with tons of enemies flooding the screen. Bullets that get very fast as the rank climbs, and tanky bosses that can feel like a battle of attrition until you figure out their tricks. But it never crosses the line into ridiculous territory like Tatsujino or Sami Sami Sami, feeling like a properly hard but fair schmuck, especially when it comes to recovery. My understanding is the international release is also a fair bit easier, at least according to super player jamers, so I'll take his word for it. Dogyun becomes a pretty hard game, so that version is a very viable option for many players to enjoy. The only area Dogyun lacks is the somewhat less creative gameplay as Uemura-san stated, just not doing anything unusual having put most of their time into the graphics. It's a fast-paced, straightforward shooter with an amazing presentation, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that. An absolute must-play as an obscure, lesser-known game. And while not crossing the line into the very top tier for me, it's without a doubt an A-tier to a plan shooter. also known as Grindstormer, was one of Toaplan's final games and the Toaplan debut of Tsuneki Ikeda, who would also program Batsugan, then move on to Cave to create the Donpachi series. And the rest is history. You can already see the Danmaku DNA here, which was taken even further in Batsugan to follow. But to me, it's V5 that feels like that perfect hybrid between old-school Toaplan and Bullet Hell. It implements a really cool option system that mimics the later spread and focus shots of cave titles, except here you use the same shot button for both. Simply letting go and moving forward spreads them out, and moving backward condenses them into a focus beam. It also has the Gradius-like weapon selection menu, where you can vary your loadout during the game like the much older slap fight, changing the way your options behave, power up your damage, and even activate a shield, which comes in super handy as V5 is yet another very hard game. No, not unfair hard. It strikes a balance. What makes V5 so tough is that it's a borderline early Denmaku, but with checkpoints. Imagine playing a game like Batsugan, only without respawn, where death sends you back and powers you down. There's a reason future cave games remove checkpoints, as that would just be too brutal. And that one feature is what makes V5 brutal indeed. 
the international version Grindstormer is unique is that it completely removes the Gradius style power-up system simplifying the gameplay, along with adding bombs but removing any option for a shield. In some cases, it makes the game more difficult, as not being able to adjust your loadout effectively throughout different parts of the game can make it even trickier. I personally enjoy the menu style power-up and prefer the original. Another big name involved with V5 that many don't know was Naora Yusuke. Yes, that Yusuke, who shortly worked for Toa Plan before moving on to become the king of Final Fantasy art for Square Enix. He was joined on the project by Mikio Yamaguchi, who went on to work on games like Snow Bros 2, Air Gallery, Esperade, and Mushihima Sama. While the color palette is more pastel here versus the shiny, flashy dogyun, V5 is still incredibly impressive in terms of design. Stages are a mix of open worlds and caverns, multi-scrolling backdrops, and evil, alien-like strongholds, and one of the most diverse set of environments in a shooter. The strong visual presentation is backed up by another fantastic soundtrack by Masahiro Yuge. which also has an interesting story behind it. He very much wanted to use PCM sound, like he was able to for the first time with Tatsujino. But due to budget problems and business Yoink. decisions, they were forced to clear out their old inventory of sound chips instead. So he ended up working with only 128K of ROM space. Without question, the sound design is outstanding. But whether you love it or not depends on your nostalgia for that old school FM sound. <laughs> V5 sounds raw, grating, and properly badass. If you love the sound of Mega Drive games, you'll fall in love with the sound of V5. Others may find it a bit harsh, but what's not up for debate is the absolute up to your gameplay. Ikeda-san clearly had a talent for programming and a knack for what makes a great shmup. Not simply imitating, but innovating from the get-go. V5 is thrilling in all the right ways. It's pre-cave, proto-cave, with instantly recognizable ways in which enemies come on screen and the patterns they fire. A formula he would refine and perfect. He mentioned that they intentionally slowed down the bullets, but added a lot more on the screen at once, so players could enjoy the thrill of dodging so many. V5 was begun as a training exercise for the new team of employees, with just basic starting code provided and direction given by Yuge-san. To this, they added their own style and flavor, resulting in quite a hybrid of a game. You'll not find a shooter with this cool a mix of old and new, and is a great alternative to those who simply don't jive with the full-on bullet hell that followed. More bullets on screen, but also a smaller hitbox to compensate, something that was inadvertently in the original code that the team just decided to keep. It's also a comfortable length for a shooter of this difficulty at under 30 minutes from start to completion. Sometimes you can't quite put your finger on it, but a game is just fun to play, and V5 was the beginning of a new direction for the genre as a whole. ported to the Mega Drive as Grindstormer, and while it took a big hit in terms of color, detail, and the amount of bullets on screen, it's also a bit of a marvel for what it pulls off. It was an ambitious port, sometimes buckling under the hardware limitations, being a game that was better suited for the later Saturn, yet somehow still providing a really good gameplay experience. It was this port that I first played, long before I ever tried the arcade original, and immediately found it to be one of my favorite Mega Drive shooting games may be watered down but still captures the spirit of the original. And the sound? Well, the FM sound is reproduced faithfully and, uh, love it or hate it, as grating as ever. Overall, V5 is a fantastic game and one of my favorite Toa Plan shooters. The more time you spend with it, the more you see how brilliant its art design was. And along with the rad music and sound effects by Yugi-san, despite the limitations put on it, I personally love that old school sound having grown up during that era. 
and without a doubt, gameplay chops to spare and one of the most fun and unique shooters out there, along with being a peek into what legendary programmer Tsuneki Ikeda would do in the future. V5 is on my list of top 5 Toa Plan shooters and an S tier game in the library. last, but certainly not anywhere close to least, is Tsuneki Ikeda's mini masterpiece in Toplan Swan Song. If you're going to go out with a bang, a game like Batsugan is the way to do it. Officially recognized as the prototypical manic shooter that bridged the gap between the classics and bullet hell, it introduced new types of bullet patterns never seen before, along with massive weapon power that filled the screen with bullets a default fast ship and no need for speed ups, and the checkpoint system removed in favor of instant respawn. Matsugan was something completely new. It inspired future games that would follow, along with being an excellent game in its own right. Matsugan's art design was done by now famous game and manga artist Inoue Jr., aka Joker Jr., who went on to do the art for numerous cave games like Death Smiles, Pro Gear, Dodonpachi, and many more. His artwork was on fire, and he's actually signed on to be part of the Toa Plan documentary I mentioned at the start, offering to do the artwork for the backer exclusive Blu-ray set. Super exciting. While not as over the top as Dogyu, Matsugan is a bold and beautiful game, cramming tons of variety into its very short runtime. And Batsugan is short pioneering yet another trend in the genre, shifting to short, intense experiences where every moment of gameplay is packed with action. The Toa Plan classics purposefully mixed brutal, intense segments with moments of quiet, like a calm before the next storm. Batsugan helped usher in the era of nothing but storm from start to finish, where shmups became more about scoring and looping, not simply survival or enjoying the scenery. It's true, something important was lost in the transition, and why many still gravitate to the classics over Danmaku. On the other hand, it's that refusal to adapt to the times that slowly did shmups in. But not yet, in 1994 it was time for a change, and Batsugan was the harbinger. Stages lasting mere minutes, with all five completed in less than 20 minutes. Instead of power-ups, Batsugan used an experience system, where simply killing enemies and racking up score levels up your shot. Along with a bomb, it's as straightforward as it gets, without any tricky weapon mechanics. And that's by design, as your focus will be squarely on routing and dodging the massive amount of bullets that come your way. Techniques like bullet hurting and streaming U-shaped patterns becomes a necessity. That's not to say that Batsugan is brutally hard, which it isn't. The ability to respawn with a fast ship and decent firepower, along with a renewed stock of bombs, means you don't have to play flawlessly. The opening stage is pretty laid back and lets you get your bearings. Only the stage boss ready to surprise casual players with a high-speed barrage. Even stage 2 is reasonable, before ramping up more significantly on 3. You get 3 ship types to choose from, and all have a powerful screen-filling shot. Batsugan isn't nearly as difficult as many of Toplan's other games, but a solid challenge level to clear on a credit. There was also a special version of the board created, but never made it to arcades due to Toplan closing their doors later that year, despite the game having success. However, a near arcade perfect port released on the Saturn, which included the special version as well. And this version is quite special, as it's focused on scoring, loops and has an easier first loop, meaning it's the best version for a beginner to start with. Your ship's hitbox is even smaller, and you get a shield with each life. And most importantly for experts, a cornucopia of increased scoring options across many loops of increasing difficulty, along with suicide bullets starting on loop 2, which the original game didn't have at all. All that being said, Batsugan could have been better. While the character, enemy, and ship designs are outstanding and the colors bold, the backgrounds are standard as they come, a far cry from the beauty of Dagyun or Tatsujino. The soundtrack, however, is excellent overall, with some great memorable tunes, even if it doesn't quite reach the heights of either Uemura-san's or Yugi-san's best work. And yet, Batsugan is special. 
not just for what it began, but on its own merits as a fantastic shooter where gameplay is king. Many cite it as their favorite Toa Plan game, especially those of a younger and Gunmaku-oriented generation that don't jive with the classic, checkpoint-based shooters that myself and others grew up with. Taken on its own, it's a game with great art and enemy design, despite the basic backdrops, a good soundtrack that suits the game well, but most obviously, gameplay that once again defined the genre and gave a glimpse of its future. Batsugan is fast, furious, and an absolute thrill to play. While not my favorite of the library, it's still an A-tier shooter and rightfully revered by many as one of their best. え、こんにちは。上村達也です。え、僕が選ぶ とにかくグラフィックがかっこいい。トワプランのベスト この順位は意外に思われる方も多いかもしれませんけれども、続いて最高のバランスになったと自負しています。そして僕の中のトワプラン2スクロールのシューティングゲームがとても苦手だったし、Toa Plan didn't just make great games, they were also the most unusual developer of the 80s and 90s. They threw wild parties, spent all night drinking and fighting at bars before going back to work, had their offices raided by the Yakuza, took turns diving buck naked into freezing waters, and generally did whatever the hell they wanted. But they also loved their work. 
loved shooting games, and spent every waking moment either working or partying. They did everything together, and that sense of brotherhood, reckless abandon, and dedication to their craft resulted in games with a personality all their own. For the first time, likely the last time, they're coming forward and offering to share their story with us. Not just insights into their games and the industry, but also an inside look into what made their time at Toa Plan so memorable. They plan to revisit old offices, bars, and hangouts, and talk about the experiences they shared there. Not just a history, but two discs of special features, extras, discussions, and deep dives into their games by the staff themselves. There hasn't been, nor may be again, a more important documentary for the shooting genre. Both myself and Joseph are incredibly excited to make it happen and make it amazing. So if this documentary sounds as awesome to you as it does to me, please consider supporting the Kickstarter before it ends. Help us reach the final stretch goals to make this the best gaming documentary yet. Help us help Toa Plan tell their story. And we promise to make it every bit the amazing video such an important developer deserves. And if you haven't yet watched the official trailer, you can do that now, right here.